Brothers and sisters who are listening, we come to another session uh, of the themes of the Quran and last week we covered about the seven different states of the heart in a positive sense and seven different states of the heart in a negative sense and we said that the dhikr of Allah when it's, when it's there and when the mind is set on remembering Allah then, the, then you have more of a positive heart and when there is ghafla or there is absent-mindedness then the heart will become something which will, become, will, will go towards a negative sort of side. What we want to look is further uh, towards the heart because uh, the heart is the very place where Allah Azza wa Jal says most of what the human being is and what he's doing is taking place inside. When I say the heart, I mean the qalb. So in the qalb in, in Arabic, like I said, is something that, that turns and switches. And there's a very unique thing the Qur'an has done. The Qur'an has not said that the brain or the, or the, the faculty we've got above here is the only thing that makes judgments. The Qur'an sometimes has said that we make judgments from here and the Qur'an has said we make judgments from here as well. And what it's done is it's linked the so-called qalb, qalb which is we translate as the heart, but qalb which is the thing that changes and I've said sometimes it's referred to as the mind. It is that very thing inside the human being that has got a connection from down here to above here. So what happens in the human being is that when we're making decisions, sometimes we're making very logical decisions, but sometimes we're making decision, decisions with the heart. And there's a very clear connection between the two. And all of us, when we're making a, when we're doing something, we've got a very clear connection with both parts of our, uh, our body. And the Qur'an has not separated the, the, the process of making a decision from the heart. This, this is very important. Why? Because the Qur'an specifies very specifically that most of what's happening to the human being and the things that we do come from, from this thing called the qalb and this thing that changes inside us. And what happens is that the human being, if he is going to do some bad action, it is because his, his heart or his qalb has become diseased. It's got a disease. And if the human being was to do something very good, and he's, he's, he becomes very sort of um, emotional when he comes to listen to the Qur'an and he's very inclined towards Allah, then it is the heart again. So let's give the verses uh, to, to um, substantiate that point. In the 22 uh, juz of, or the 22nd juz of the Qur'an, uh, in, the, in the beginning, so this is Surah Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayah 32. Allah Azza wa Jal tells the wives of the Prophets of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells the wives of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam that they should beware of people like if they, if they go outside and if they display their ornaments or if they were to go outside without, without, the, you know, without covering themselves then what happens is the one who has got a disease in his heart will be the one who will desire them, who will, have the, who will have the desire towards them. So what the Quran has said here is, the one who has the desire, so let's just say there's a, there's a uh, man out there and he has a problem with, with, with himself in terms of where, you know, where he's looking or he, he has a problem every time he has some beautiful women or whichever type of women coming in front of him, then he has this thing that he wants to be inclined towards them. Then we, what we see is we see the outer action, we see the outer sort of body. And we see this person reacting towards that, wanting to move towards those women and so on. And he, of course, if he had the chance, then he'd probably proceed and probably go further and further. That's what we see. What Allah Azza wa has identified as the root problem is the qalb. 
Because فَيَطْمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٌ Once their heart has got the disease, then the actions or the outer of the, of the body, the person's outer body, will, will start to be corrupted because the heart has been corrupted. In another part of the Qur'an, this is Surah, uh, this is Surah Al-Anfal. Surah Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 2. Allah Azza wa describes the true believers and here he's describing, describing some of the sifat some of the qualities of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in. And Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Allah Azza wa says that when, you know, the, the true believers are those that when the mention of Allah is there, when they hear the mention of Allah, وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts start to tremble وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا And when the, when the verses of the Qur'an are recited onto them, then the, the iman increases. Now look at this ayah in the Holy Qur'an, surah, surah number 8, ayah number 2. What Allah Azza wa is doing here is saying that the hearts tremble and then iman increases. And the effects of that is that when the Sahaba radiallahu anhu when they used to listen to the Qur'an, they would, they would be drawn to tears because of listening to the Qur'an. They would, their hearts would soften. They would be inclined towards Allah. And it says here, وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And upon the Lord, they, they, they you know, put their trust. So their trust in Allah increases a lot more because of the fact that their hearts have already been attached towards Allah. And that's where, well, that's where the area is where they've got their iman. And in fact, Allah Azza wa has said in um, Surah, this is Surah number, uh, this is in the 28th Juz. In the beginning of the 28th Juz, Surah number six, uh, Surah number sorry, 58, uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, "Ulaika kataba fi qulubihim iman Allah Azza wa Jalla has destined. Allah Azza wa Jalla has prescribed the iman and written the iman or placed the iman in their hearts. So this is. Uh, this is the last verse of Surah, surah 58, surah, surah Mujadala. The last verse of that, uh, Surah number 58, you will find that Allah Azza wa says that their hearts, the hearts have got the Iman and Allah has prescribed that Iman in their hearts. Now, what this shows is that all the things that are going on inside us have a direct effect on the things that are happening outside of us. And the thing that's happening inside in our hearts, if, it's, if there's a corruption, then on the outside there is a corruption and if there is rectification on the inside, they, on the outside you will find a good, a, a, a good person and you will find rectified deeds. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in one hadith of Muslim, he explained that to us. And he said, Ala inna fi kulli jasadin mudha. He said, beware that in every single body there is a morsel of flesh. Idha saluhat, saluhal jasad kullu. When that morsel of, when that morsel of flesh is, is uh, rectified and the whole body is rectified. Where either fasadat, and when that when that morsel of flesh is is corrupted, then the whole body is corrupted. Allah wa hi al qalb. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that that is the that is the heart. Now, of course, he's not literally talking about the 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 heart that we have in here, but that's the place where all of this is is taking place. Now, what happens is if a person's aqida or their belief towards like if they're in their heart if you've got a crookedness and if you've got a thing inside you that when something t when something is said to you which is which is fine and which is logical and so on but what you want to do is you want to understand you, your heart sort of has this crookedness inside it wants to take it to a different way and that is also a disease that the quran has has said and he has said in their hearts the certain people in their hearts has a crookedness when Allah Azza wa has revealed certain verses, instead of finding the meaning that they should find, they might find a different meaning of the Qur'an and therefore they fall into trouble. And this is in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, um, in, the, in the beginning, Ayah number 7, Allah Azza wa has said, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغِ as, as for the people who have this crookedness in their heart, they will start to find or they will start to pursue the means of the Qur'an that they shouldn't really pursue. So it shows that the heart can have crookedness. In another part, in several parts of the Qur'an, it talks about a disease. And one big disease it talks about is the disease of, of being doubtful. 
and most of what the munafiqeen became. So, so the, the, the true believers are those who have no doubts and no crookedness in their hearts. But if a believer ha a a allows some, some, of, some of the doubts to creep into the heart, then he is or she is in a difficult position of becoming a munafiq or becoming a hypocrite. And we covered this in one of the sessions before. But what's, what's to be said uh, as an essential thing is that in the beginning of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jalla opened it up by saying, Thalika al-kitabu la rayba This is a book, that there is no doubt in there. Then after a few verses of Surah Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Fi qulubihim marad. When he describes the munafiqun, when he describes the hypocrites, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Fi qulubihim maradun. In their hearts there is a disease. This is Surah number 2, Ayah number 10. And Allah Azza wa increases the disease in the heart. And they have a tormenting punishment because of the lies that they, that they have committed to. Now, what this shows is having doubt in the heart, having any sort of, you know, any place in the heart where you're not fully committing to the beliefs of Islam to the aqidah of Islam, to the, to the faith of Islam, will cause a person to have bad behavior. And all the behaviors of the munafiqun that have been recorded in the Quran is because of that, the, the, that doubt that was there in the first place. And, and that doubt led them to, to sometimes lie, sometimes conspire against the Prophet Wasallam, sometimes you know, mock the, the believers, mock the Sahaba radiallahu anhu This is all in the Quran. Sometimes they, they stole things. Sometimes they uh, became people who were very lazy towards the Salah, very lazy towards the, the, the deen and being active towards the deen. They were lazy in terms of that. Now, what that means is, subhanAllah al I think I've, I've mentioned this before, but just to reiterate again today, is that if you see a lot of the ummah today, they're very sort of lazy towards the, the deen, very lazy towards the commitment of the religion. And that is what's happened, is that their hearts haven't fully, fully attached, it's, the hearts haven't attached itself, or hasn't attached itself towards what Allah Azza wa has revealed in the Quran. And because there's a, there's a very light attachment towards this, that's why they don't have the pull. They don't, they don't feel that they need to you know, have that, that, that great pull towards the, towards the Quran and towards the Sunnah of the Prophet Now, there's a very important um, part of the Quran. It's a surah of the Quran, Surah Hujurat, which is surah number 49. And what you find in there is that Surah Hujurat describes the, the Sahaba radiallahu ajma'in in terms of being together and in terms of uh, having differences of opinion, in terms of even you know, a fight possibly occurring. All of that is in Surah Hujurat. You'll find in Surah Hujurat it talks about uh, backbiting, it talks about spying on each other, talks about these, these bad things, okay? So backbiting is one, spying on one another, having bad thoughts is another one, um, calling names is another one, all in Surah Hujurat, Surah number 49. Ayah number 11, you will find about calling names. Ayah number 11, you will find about racism. Ayah number 12, you'll find about, you know, the, the, the bad sort of suspicions. Ayah number 12, again, you'll find about the, about the, you know, not to spy and not to backbite and so on. Ayah number um, nine, you'll find about not to, not to fight with one another. So this is all about the believers and how we cooperate with one another. Ayah number eight, you will find that uh, we're supposed to, you know, stay away or uh, hate, hate sort of, you know, disbelief and so on, stay away from that, from, from there and, and come towards belief and ha have, have that as a, as, a, as a station thing in, in ourselves. Now, what this surah does is that this surah, when it explains all of these bad things and bad habits that are going, going on, in the beginning, well, before it comes and describes these bad habits, in ayah number seven, Allah Azza says that these are the Sahaba radiallahu anhu admain. He says, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah Azza wa Jal has you know, you're different from the other people. Because Allah Azza wa Jal has made Iman lovable to you and He has made it as something very adorned and very, something that is very sort of attractive in your hearts. وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرِ And He has made you detest and dislike disbelief. 
He has made you dislike uh, rebellion and he has made you dislike disobedience. Ula'ika humur rashidun. These are the people who are, who are rightly guided. This is in Surah Hujrat talking about the condition of the heart. Now think about it. What Allah Azza wa is doing is He's saying that when the heart has got love of Iman, when the heart has got an inclination towards Iman, then all of these things won't happen. The fighting won't happen. The racism won't happen. The calling names won't happen. The, the suspicion won't happen. The, uh, the uh, having, having bad thoughts about one another won't happen. The backbiting won't happen. All of these things won't happen. In fact, what Allah does again in the, when He describes the people who have fallen into these, into these habits, in the same surah, surah number 49, ayah number 14, Allah Azza wa Jal says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا The Bedouin said, that yeah, we believe, we're the same, we're the, you know, we believe, we're, we're equal in belief with the Sahaba radiallahu anhu an majma'in. And Allah Azza wa Jal then said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is going to be recited until the Day of Judgment, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا Tell them that you haven't believed like the Sahaba radiallahu anhu an majma'in. Like the rest of the Sahaba who have spent time with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who have managed to make faith something that is lovable in the heart, something that they're attached towards, and something which makes them stay away from all of these bad, bad habits, you haven't believed in the same way. وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَسْلَمْنَا But say that you have got an outwardly submission so far. You haven't yet believed, your hearts haven't fully engrossed in the very things which the Sahaba uh, have, have attached themselves towards, but you have outwardly submitted. And Iman has not yet penetrated into your hearts. Okay, now this is, this is important for us to understand. And, and this is going to be the, 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 you know, the matter of what we're talking about today, which is when we're talking about the heart, what happens is anything that comes towards the heart, it can first come towards the, towards, uh, let's just say, for example, if I give you a, an example, um, if you had a castle, let's say a castle of the, of, the, of the time before, then the castle will have, let's say, a moat around it, so, so there's some water around it where, you know, you can't actually penetrate in the castle. It's probably got a, you know, if you cross the, cross the moat, if you cross that water, uh, it's probably got large sort of walls and so on, which you can't penetrate. If you get into those walls, there's going to be several, several other walls inside for you to reach the very chamber where you've got the king or you've got the queen inside. Okay? So traditionally, they made these large castles as fortresses, and they had several layers of walls around them and they had even water and other things around just to make sure that nothing enters, enters the heart, you know, nothing enters the castle easily. The same way, when you've got the heart, what happens is when something comes, let's say of doubt, something comes of crookedness, something comes of a disease, normally what will happen is that it will come towards the heart, but it hasn't fully entered yet. It's touched it, but it hasn't entered yet. When that thing spends time with the heart, then it starts to penetrate inside. Okay? The same happens with good things. So when I've come to the masjid, see a lot of people don't, don't, don't understand this. And a lot of people, subhanAllah, they go to Hajj, they go to Umrah, and when they come back, they're like, wow, wow, I just can't, you know, believe. You know, I'm amazed, I'm amazed for the rest of my life, I'm never going to miss another salah. For the rest of my life, I'm going to feel like this. You know, they're on a hype, why? Because Mecca, Medina, the Kaaba, the, the Medina Munawwara Masjid and the atmosphere and the Muslims and the, the, the grandeur, uh, grandeur effect of all of that has touched their heart. And when it touches your heart, you are someone that is, that is you know, definitely affected by it. But if you don't allow that to penetrate into the heart, then it's not going to be long lasting. It's going to be a small effect and it will go. Good or bad, there's a penetration in the heart. The deeper it goes, the more the person, you know, just feels that they want to be you know, attached to it. So, subhanAllah, I think, I think you all know, you probably heard all these stories about, you know, some guy 
who probably has fallen in love with a, with a girl, all right? Now, it depends. It depends how deep that love becomes. Because there can, there can be certain depths of love that this man is going to give up. Forget, you know, first he, get, first he started to quarrel with his family, okay? Then he started to give some monies to this, to this woman. Then as his love becomes deep and deeper, what does he do? He starts to give more money. He starts to spend more time with her. Then he starts to become more distant with the very family that were with him for his entire life. Okay? Then when he gets very deep, he's like, well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give up my house. He's ready to give up his family. He's ready to give up his, his whole house. He's ready to give up his comfort because of this person. Then comes a time when he's gone away with her and first he still has some attachment to his family. He might, you know, sort of call him and he might have some kind of, you know, conversation with them. But if he gets very deep, he doesn't care. You know, he, he, can, he can be totally gone. And, and, and what happens sometimes is um, years later, you know, these guys, they wake up. Years later, they wake up. <laughs> when they wake up, they realize, you know, what happened to me? I spent the last 10 years, the last five years, I spent giving everything I've got just for this mad, crazy love that I had. And it can get to that. And subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa explained in the Holy Quran that the people who fell in love with worshipping the calf in the time of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah said, وَأُشْرِبُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْعِجْلِ Allah said that it was almost like they drank the love potion of this calf that they were worshipping. There's a golden calf that was made in the time of Musa Samiri made it, it's a long story, but they fell in love with worshipping this calf. It became an addiction. Their whole, you know, their, their whole minds were, were corrupted because they spent time with Samiri while Musa had gone to the, to the, mount, to, 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 to the mountain to, to have a conversation with Allah Azza wa over 40 nights. They, uh, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights, they slowly got into this love so much. Allah says, Wa ushribu fi qulubihimul ajl. This is in Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, ayah number 93. He says, It's almost like they drank, they drank, this, uh, drank this love. It's like a love potion that they took inside them. Now, subhanAllah, what this means is that we have to be very careful. Because our hearts are always getting attached to something or another. It's always, first, what we learned last week is that the heart is changing, right? It never stays in the same, same place. <laughs> what we're learning this week is that whatever you attach your heart to, there is a penetration that is involved in that. So let me give you an, another example to, to uh, understand this. Sometimes when we cook certain dishes, Sometimes when we cook certain dishes, what we do is we allow it to cook a little bit longer and we allow it to settle. Why? Because we want all the masala and all the spices to get right into the meat and right into the rice. I don't know if you've ever tasted certain dishes and I'm making you hungry right now, yeah? <laughs> but the certain dishes, subhanAllah, you know when you taste it, they, they cook the meat, okay? You taste the meat and, and inside it's all bland. Inside it's just like white or sort of, you know, the, the red meat that you've got. Uh, and you taste it, you taste the meat. But what happens is that on the outside, the masala is there, it's just touched it on the outside, but it hasn't penetrated inside. And if it hasn't penetrated inside, <coughs> la ilaha illallah, you'll have, a, you'll have the food, but you're not gonna enjoy that much. I'll give you another trick, okay? Some of you could try this, okay? Uh, barbecues, making barbecues, okay? And this is a really good example of giving, giving uh, with regards to this. If you've ever done a barbecue, the people who do a barbecue and they take the meat and they marinate the meat and they put it straight onto the, onto the you know, through the skewers, straight onto the grill, uh, and, and they start, they start to barbecue straight away, I'm telling you one thing, it's not gonna taste, it's not gonna taste that nice. Right? It'll be okay, it'll be fine, but it's not gonna taste that nice. That, that, that nice. Why? The better method to do it is this that you take the marinating, you marinate it 24 hours before or 48 hours before. 48 hours before, marinate it, before you're gonna serve, or before you're gonna cook the, cook the, uh, uh, the, the meat. So you marinate it, then you leave it in the fridge 
for 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, you leave it in the fridge. What happens is all the marinating masala, whatever you put in there, will start to penetrate right into the meat. It will find its way slowly, the meat will suck it all inside. When it sucks it inside, I'll tell you one thing, when you cook that meat, you'll see, you'll see the, 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 the you know, praises that you're going to get from your, from your family and from your friends. Now, the reason why I gave you that is because whatever you're, you're leaving your heart with, whether it's the dhikr of Allah, whether it's something that the shaitan has put in front of you, whether it's anything else, it has a penetration. And if you don't watch out, it sucks it in. And once it sucks it in, you now have to allow that much time for it for you to suck it, or, or more time for you to suck out all of that you know, effect that it's got inside it. So what, what am I trying to get to next? What I'm tr trying to get to next is we have our hearts and if you've been affected by, and I'm going to name a number of things, if you've been affected by greed, some people have got this greed that, that you know, anytime there's money involved, anytime there's talk of money, there's the smell of money, then these people, you know, they, they, they lose sight of everything else. Greed is a disease of the heart. But it's got a penetration, which means that you can be slightly greedy or you can be very heavily, heavily greedy, depending on how long you've allowed this greed to, you know, absorb, be absorbed into your heart. And some people, they are so greedy that la ilaha illallah, it's like getting, stone, it's like getting blood out of a stone when you want to get some sadaqah out, outside of them. They're, they're not ready to share any of it. They don't want to give any of it because it's like, you know, it's second, <laughs> this is mine. I, I, just, I just love it so much. I just want, I don't want to give it to anybody else. You know, it's just, just, just mine. So people are, are greedy. Now, greed is one. Another one is uh, arrogance. So certain people, you'll find them, they think of themselves to be superior than others. In a way that, subhanAllah, when the truth comes in front of them, and the person who they're looking down onto has the truth, they can't accept it. This is arrogance. They will, you know, if the truth is with the person they're looking down on, it's like, because, I'm, because I feel I'm so high, okay, I feel so I'm so high, because I have contempt for you and you're low, okay, I know you've got the truth, but if I accept your truth, then that means you become higher than me and I become lower than you. Do, do, you, guys, do you guys understand that? Yeah, this is, the, this is the problem. And because they've allowed this arrogance to penetrate into their hearts so long, it becomes almost impossible for them to let go of it. I mean, what was Abu Jahl's problem with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It was arrogance. Abu Jahl's problem with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the, ver the very thing I just said. It's like he's looked down on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One of his big problems was this, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is going to be treated small. He's mocked him, he's, he's, you know, he's said that you're nothing and so on. And what happens is now he sees the truth, he sees the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But Abu Jahl has led an entire life of arrogance. He's the big man. If you make him big, then perhaps he'll give you some credit, otherwise you're nothing. So he's looking for his big credit. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa obviously is not going, to buy, you know, not going to give in to him. And Abu Jahl would not accept it, even though Abu Jahl knew, for 100% for he knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had the truth. What was the, um, the crime of Iblis? It was jealousy. This hasad he had. And not only that, but Iblis's crime also was kibr. It was arrogance. He had this arrogance where he saw Adam والسلام, and he thought, uh -uh, I, I, I'm better than him, I'm greater than him. He had the hope that he's going to become the new thing on the earth where Allah would send him as a leader and suddenly Allah creates Adam والسلام, to become the leader of, of, of you know, the world and so on. He's going to civilize the whole world. And Allah has identified his, his problem. His problem was what? His problem mainly is Allah said istakbara. He had this, this arrogance inside him and he's not going to accept it. And it doesn't matter how good the truth is, I'm not going to accept it. Now, imagine this, subhanAllah. It's penetrated so deep into the heart that now it's become impossible for this person to turn back. 
What was the problem of the Jewish people in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepting, uh, not accepting his message? And this is all in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, Surah number two, ayah number one zero nine. Allah has said, "Hasadam min indi anfusihim, min baadi ma tabayyara lahum alhaq." Allah said that the truth was absolutely clear to these individuals who were Jewish individuals in Rasulullah's time in Medina Munawwara, some of the Jewish individuals. And Allah said the only reason why they can't accept the truth, even ma tabayyan alakul haq, the truth is absolutely clear to them. Allah said, Hasadam min indi anfusim. They had this jealousy. And this jealousy in the heart grew so much and it was there so deep. This was generations of jealousy, my friend. It's <laughs> not small jealousy because these people had every prophet in their lineage, in their, in their blood. They had every prophet that came in their blood. They were the Banu Israel. And then suddenly the best of all prophets, the last prophet, the one who's supposed to be the savior of the Banu Israel later on, the one who's promised in the Torah, the one who they were looking for, waiting for, his blood is in the Arabs. And the Arabs? No way. The Arabs will look down, we've looked down on you all our lives. You can't have that blood inside. No, no way. No way this is going to happen. That blood, that, that prophet has to be in our blood. He can't be in your blood. And Allah said that, that's the reason why. And this jealousy thing, subhanAllah al-Azim, you know, a lot of the problems that we have, you know, I, I, I've just said to you about three different problems, okay? I've said to you about greed, about arrogance, about jealousy, and all in the heart, all in the heart. Now think about it, yeah? When two women are fighting in the same household, one could be a sister-in-law, another a sister-in-law, one could be a mother-in-law, another one could be a daughter-in-law, whatever, whatever the, the, the situation is, yeah? And they're bitter towards each other and it's going on for years and the bitterness is increasing and increasing. What is their, what is their true problem? Anyone tell me? Jealousy. jealousy. Thank you. It's jealousy. And that jealousy can become so bitter that it could lead to all kinds of troubles. It could lead to hating that other woman's children. It happens or it doesn't happen. Yeah. That woman gives birth to beautiful children. Oh my God, I hate all of them because their children are looking better than my children. Right? That woman's husband I hate because he's such a good man. I hate him because he's such a good man. Do you understand? Jealousy. Jealousy gets in that. In fact, it gets so bad that, uh, and this is a problem we've got in the UK. Okay? Whether you want to you know, may Allah Azza wa Jal protect all of us. You know, we, we've got a big problem in this, this country uh, and in the Western world is that we've got, we, we, we've got, uh, we've got uh, some good money, you know, you, you know talking about, you know. You know when you've got disease of the heart and you've got money? Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, poison, thank you brother, it is poison. It's led to people committing black magic on one another. There's been a huge, there's a huge problem. Because of what? Jealousy. Black magic. I mean, they, they think they're, they're absolved. They, they, they say, I never did it. I never did it. I just went to some Hindu person who just happened to have the voodoo things in their hands, who I just gave some money to. Oh, I didn't do it. I sent someone else over there to give the money over. So it's not me. Ah, it's not you. <laughs> and you know what? We've got a huge problem. I'm not saying this is a small problem. We've got a huge problem. Many, I, you know, in fact, I go to Bangladesh. And uh, we've got cases over there, but we seem to have more cases over here. Even some of the scholars over there saying, what's going on with you guys in the UK? We seem to have more cases of these wild sort of black magic cases coming from the UK than we have in Bangladesh. And the only reason why is because the people in the UK have got money, money. You understand? When you've got a disease of the heart and you've got money, it's a huge problem. Because it goes, it rips into, you know, it rips into the entire system. They'll rip into everything. They'll, they'll use the money to go as far as they can to hurt the other person. But if I ask you the question now, what was the reason for these two people to hate each other? For them to quarrel, argue, hate each other's, you know, 
faces, hate each other, everything about them, and eventually end up, one of them ends up doing something very horrible to the other. And it could be even trying to, you know, cause suffocation, whatever, to each other, whatever it is, or even the black magic that I said. What, what <laughs> made them do this? The thing is, it's the disease of the heart, which is hasad, which is je je jealousy. And each one of these things, when it enters the heart, it, you know, and it penetrates inside, if you don't do something about it to, to take it out or to solve the problem that you've got inside you, you can't, you know, you, you're, on the, you're on the wrong path and you're going to damage yourself one, you're going to make one mistake after another mistake. And guess what? Logically, your head will tell you that you're doing the wrong thing, but you just can't help it. Why? Because this is the heart. And the problem, with the big problem that I'm trying to identify is that when it goes deep into the heart, whew, you've got a big problem. A lot of the, uh, th there's a lot of people out there who've got a problem in the heart that the heart has had a disease inside it. I mentioned this earlier. That heart has a disease inside it that they love the opposite gender. Now, if you can't control yourself in that, okay, the gender relationship that we've got, if you can't control yourself, if, if you can't make yourself feel that, look, you know what, I've got one woman, and I'm happy and you know this is the nikah and finished and we're just going to move on and I don't need to sort of you know look you know elsewhere and 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 look for illicit relationships and so on if you can't control yourself it's a huge problem because it's going to take you from one trouble to another trouble to another trouble all those people who gamble all those people who have got that problem of gambling people who've got problems of uh, let's say the the alcohol they've got you know addiction problems okay What's their problem? What was their problem? Their problem was perhaps sloth, something, some, some kind of laziness, something where they're just letting themselves go. Their problem was that they lost self-discipline. Why? Because they allowed a disease to get into the heart, whether it was greed or something else, they allowed that to get inside. And when that grows and it penetrates inside, you lose everything. And look at gamblers. Gamblers start with the one pounds, they start with a few pennies and then it becomes an addiction and what they say is subhanallah they say and this is studies about people who gamble the people who gamble you know first was the greed of the of the money you know they wanted to get the the extra money so they thought you know what I can get a hundred thousand pounds and a million pounds <laughs> you know soon when the gambler has, has spun into loss and loss and sometimes wins and sometimes losses, you know what, what they say, the psychological study of a gambler is, they're looking for the crave of the win. It's not about the money anymore. Yes, they want the money, but more than the money, they are for the crave of being in that position in the win. You know when you've just won something and you go, wow, you know, I took all that risk I put, I sank my heart in this. I thought I might lose everything. And the moment I gambled it and then I won this, it was like, whoa. And I seen the faces of those I'm gambling with and their faces all black because they all lost. And now I'm like, whoa. You know that thrill? They're after that. That becomes addiction. What's the, what's the problem of the, of the person who's, who's alcoholic? They have, you know, ghafla, which I mentioned last week, which is being absent-minded, just total, total, just lost, lost with your thoughts, you know, just, just not thinking about what you're supposed to think of. This is known as ghafla, just away from Allah Azza wa Jal. There, it becomes an addiction towards this. That's a disease of the heart, it enters, and the person seeks to forget all their problems by drinking alcohol. So they drink, they drink, they drink, and when they get drunk, it's like it's in a state where you've got no worry. So what are they after? They're not after the taste of the alcohol. The one who's addicted to alcohol is not after the taste of that drink. By the way, I, I haven't drunk yet. I don't know about this. I don't know about gambling yet. <laughs> I'm just talking about the, the, the... I'm interested in knowing why. You know, the psychological reasons behind this. And if you go deep, what you find is that the one who's addicted to drinking is they're not doing it because of the taste of the wine. Yes, they've got the taste of the wine and they love that, yes. But they're after a certain effect. 
And what they're after is this ghafla, which is just, just forget about everything. The one who takes drugs is in the same, same position. Because they want to get to that state where they can think about whatever they want to think and they want to have a maximum amount of thought in that area. And it's again, it's ghafla. And that makes them, you know, it brings them a certain kind of addiction and then they're lost. What happens to the one who kills the murderer? Where's his, where's his problem, tell me? The one who kills somebody else? What's his problem? Anyone tell me? Mental. Sorry? Craziness. You can say craziness, yes, but there, there is a state that they have to be able to think that, you know what, I'm going to pick up that gun and I'm going to go and shoot that person. Anger. Anger, right? Anger is another thing that can come into the heart. And when it comes, it can totally take over. And it's one of those things that depends how deep it penetra penetrates again. Which is that you can be angry a little bit, you can be angry you know, a lot. And Rasulullah has described this in, in a hadith. And he said there's four types of people when it comes to anger. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi. <laughs> he says there's the type of person, one type of person, it takes them a long time to get angry but a long time to calm down. Do you guys, do you guys understand? It takes him a long time to get angry, but a long time to calm down. Okay? Bati ul ghadab, bati ul faith. Type two. It takes them <clears throat> a short time to get angry and a short time to calm down. Sari'u al-ghadab, sari'u al So they quickly get angry, they have outbursts. They get angry and they calm down again, right quick. But they get angry really quickly and they calm down. You know, they have these spouts all the time, okay? Both again, they're problematic. Now the first one that, okay, takes a long time to get angry, but once he's angry, man, you know, it's, it's, this part is a problem. Taking time to cool down. The second one, the problem is that they keep on getting angry. And the type three is, it takes the, it, it, they, they get angry really quickly. This is the worst type. They get angry really quickly, and it takes them a long time to cool down. <laughs> Do you understand? Sari ul ghadab, bati ul The Prophet says that, gets angry really quick, and once they're angry, it takes them a long time to calm down. Man, you don't want to have a husband or a wife like that, man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Just want to, la hulu la quwata illa billah. And the best one the Prophet ﷺ described is the, the sari, uh, sorry, sorry, bati ul ghadab sari ul fayt. He said the one that it takes a long time to get angry, but a short time to cool down. You guys understand? And Rasulullah was of that type. You guys understand? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was of this of this type that it took a long time for you to make him angry, but when he was angry, he calmed down really quickly. Now, with regards to the other three types that we we explained, these are problems, and depending on how bad you are in terms of the penetration of anger into your heart, I mean. You could have a small problem to a big problem, but again, it's a problem. And some people, like those people who get, once they get angry, it's like they don't care. You know, that's it. It's, it's you know, great, you know, it's just like crazy anger, which is just not coming, calming down. What will they do? They, they will start committing a crime, whether it's shooting someone, harming someone, doing something bad, they, they will do it. But it's again, it's a disease of the heart that slowly, slowly, you know, catches on. And, and if you don't sort the problem out, then it's going to go on and it could do something very harmful. Now, these are things that I've said on the negative side. On the positive side, you've got things as well. So on the positive side, you've got taqwa, for example. Taqwa that the Quran has mentioned. Now, taqwa, again, has levels of penetration. You could have a taqwa, which is a very sort of, you know, light taqwa. You could have a taqwa that deeply penetrates into the heart. The taqwa that deeply penetrates into the heart is going to be the one that will take you a long way to be with Allah, even in your, close, even your most private time, even the time when no one's looking at you, even the depth of the night, you will still not sin. Even if you were left with a, 
woman next to you and no one's going to watch, no one's going to ever take you, account to, to, you to account for what you've done, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go near that woman. Even when you're left with a million pounds or two million pounds, let's say you're there in, in a place with no, you know, no cameras, no nothing, no one's going to ever have any traces on you and you've got that money right in front of you. And you can just pick it up and you can just take it. Even at that time, you won't, you won't do it because of the penetration of taqwa. And this is the thing, which is the, the Qur'an, if you look at all over the Qur'an from beginning to end, it's got this theme of taqwa, which we'll, we'll, we'll visit. All, the, all of these things, we'll try and visit them at some point. But the thing is, once taqwa gets in, with, once taqwa gets in, into the heart, the more deeper the taqwa, what's taqwa? Taqwa is an automatic defense system against sins. Okay, so the, when the moment of sin arises, you have something inside you that straight away connects with Allah. Your mind connects with Allah, your heart connects with Allah, and it says, uh -uh, my, my connection with Allah is much stronger than what I'm seeing here right now. And you have this de defense of warding yourself against from sin because your heart has connected with Allah. That's what taqwa is. The deeper you go with taqwa, the better of a person, a believer you become. Let, let me give you another, another one. Iman, for example, which we've covered in one of the earlier, you know, earlier parts of this series. Okay? Iman again. The more Iman you have, the deeper your Iman goes. Subhanallah al the, the, the greater your attachment will be with, the, with, with Allah Azza wa Jalla and the greater the benefits that you'll see. And Iman again, like what we, what we just seen in Surah Hujrat, I quoted this today, um, that, that Allah Azza wa Jalla said to those Bedouins, He said, don't say that you're believing, no. You've got an outwardly belief, outwardly submission, but you, your hearts haven't yet, you know, Iman hasn't penetrated into your hearts. This is um, Surah number 49, Ayah number 12 or 13, you, I think Ayah number 12 or 13, you'll find it around there. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ The Iman has not penetrated into your hearts. Once Iman penetrates into the heart, it's something different. Let's talk about tawakkul, a person who depends on Allah. <clears throat> We've got many levels of that again, many different forms of penetration. Normally, you know, you're sitting down here, if, if I was to tell you that... <clears throat> Do you, do, you trust, do you have all your trust in Allah? You'd say yes. But a lot of us, we've got things in the back of our minds that are supporting that taqwa, giving support to that taqwa. Right? So if I'd said, to you, do you have your full trust in Allah? You'd say, yeah, I've got my full trust in Allah. Anyone would say that. But in the back of our mind, the support is, I've got money. You understand? Anything happens to me, I got some money, I can you know, go, go and get some pills, prescriptions, whatever, see the doctors. I've got family. Anything happens to me, you know, my family, I'm going to call my family, I'm going to call my friends. I've got family, I've got friends. You understand? That's in the back of the mind, supporting all of that. Of course, we've got these fam families, we've got the friends, we've got the monies and so on. But true tawakkul on Allah is that my family can't even do anything, my friends can't do anything, the money in my bank can't do anything, the state of my health can't do anything. That's true tawakkul. Even though I'm very healthy, my tawakkul, my dependence on you know, me being good in the future is not on my, on my health. It's on the fact that Allah has full power on my health. It's not, you know, if I, if I go somewhere, let's say for example, if I go somewhere, am I afraid? No, I'm not afraid. Why are you not afraid to go in this place? Why? Because I know if anything happens to me, I can call so-and-so, I can call the police, I can call the, you know, my, my, my friend, I can call so-and-so. Touch of a button, I'll get them to come down. This is in the back of the mind. That is, again, I'm not saying that is wrong to, to have that in your mind. I'm not saying it's wrong, okay? Right? But what I'm trying to say to you is that a person who has the true, you know, the, the penetration of Tawakul in the heart is that, yes, I have got police that can come towards my rescue. I've got family and friends that can come towards my rescue, but I don't depend on them. I depend on Allah. And if Allah wants to use some means on the earth for my protection, then that's good. But Allah himself can protect me without any of these means. Though I have got the means, do you, do you all understand what I'm trying to say? There's, there's many different levels of, of, you know, of, of this that we've got. Let's talk about the, the inclination of a person towards the Qur'an. There are different levels again. There are people who listen to the Qur'an and mashallah, alhamdulillah, wonderful recitation. 
oh, I wish I could read like that. Oh, I love to read. I love to listen to the Quran when it's being recited. That's it. <clears throat> there are other people who recite it themselves on a daily basis. But there's other people who go further, who recite the Quran, who understand the Quran. That's another level of penetration. There are those who don't stop at, because Allah has mentioned all of this in the Quran. Allah has said there's iqra, there's, there's, there's a qira'ah just to read. Allah has said tilawa, reading, you know, again and again, going over it again and again, recitation. Okay, that's the second form. Allah has said there are those who will read the Quran and Allah said yatadhakkaroon. They'll, they'll make a reflection out of the Quran. They'll, they'll, ponder, they'll, they'll sort of take a lesson out of the Quran. Allah has said in the whole Quran, yatadabbaroon. Those people who go deeply, they ponder over the verse of the Quran. There are different levels. There are many different levels. Allah has said, yafqahoon. Those who will have a deep understanding of the Quran. And Allah has said those who just know that there are many different levels of, of you know, allowing our, our attachment to, to the Quran. Now, when the heart has got something good that comes to it, let's not think that just because we had this good effect for a moment or for a few moments, that it's gonna be there for a long time, no. And let's not think that I am free from the shaitan's waswasa, or the shaitan's, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the whisperings that he gives. None of us are free from that. The moment we can be free from the, from the shaitan's waswasa is when our hearts are attached to Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's, that's very clear in the Quran and in the Sunnah. That when, they, when there's dhikr, when there's actual remembrance of God, shaitan finds it very difficult to give the waswasa into the heart. But where does, where does shaitan come to to give waswasa? Alladhi yuwaswisu fi suduri nas. In the Quran, in the last surah of the Quran, it says, it's the same place where the shaitan will come. Because what the shaitan knows is, the shaitan knows that if I'm going to take over this human being, there's one place for me to go to. What's that? To the main pattern. Remember I told you about that castle? Remember I told you about that castle, right? About the castle, about the moat outside, about the, the walls, about the many different walls inside, about the chamber right inside. Shaitan knows that the whole human being, to get to the human being, you got to get to the heart. And that's why he gives the whispers into the hearts. And when shaitan comes, he's going to try and make us first. His, his first thing is he wants you to be in ghafla. He wants to be, you to be in, an, in, in, in a state where you're not thinking of Allah. He's going to try some way, something to put you in a position, put me in a position where you're kind of getting along with your life, but you're not you know, attached to Allah's remembrance. So that's ghafla, that's absent-mindedness. Once he's got you locked in a ghafla position, then it's easy for him to put his waswas. Easy for him. So for example, you know, all those examples I gave you, um, you saw a beautiful woman, right? And he makes you look at her again and again. He, put, he makes you think, you know, more and more about her. He's got you locked. Now, every time you look at her, You've got a ghafla, you've got this absent-mindedness, okay? He made you look at money or made you look towards the wealth and made you sort of say, yeah, yeah, you know what? If I had 10,000, I could do this. If I had 20,000, I could do that. Yeah, yeah, let me just earn some money. And he puts you in a system where you're earning money, you're getting some kind of, you know, more and more, more. He puts you in ghafla. Where you're like, you're now, after the money, you're looking at the, you know, every day, you're, you're looking at, okay, how much have I got today? How much have I got, how much did I have yesterday? Let me make comparisons. How much will I have tomorrow? What, what are my plans for the year? What can I buy with this? What are, all of that, he's got you in ghafla, right? Once he's got you in ghafla with something, his next thing is, then, then he can stay there and he can, he can put a lot of whisperings inside the heart. That woman who was jealous of another woman, what happened? Again, he made her feel in a certain way that she was, you know, she was not going to have it. She's not going to have that woman telling her what to do. She's not going to have the woman around, you know, being like that. She's not going to have that beautiful woman being around and she's looked, you know, she's not as important as her because everyone else is looking at her right now. I mean, it starts from there, but now that she's got her eyes fixed onto that, he's put her into ghafla. She's not thinking of Allah when she's doing all of this. She's not thinking of that. She's fixed onto that. Those people on drugs, those people on, on, on alcohol, those people on all these addictions, he's got them linked to something and then his work starts. 
his main work starts, which is he's going to carry on putting whisperings inside. And when he puts whisperings inside, what he's doing is he's making these people move further and further because he's penetrating into their hearts. He's penetrating right into their hearts. Now, there's, 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 there's good news as well. I don't want to. I don't want to leave you off in a bad note and think that Allahu Akbar, Astaghfirullah, all this. Oh my God, how am I going to stay away from all of this? Yeah. There's a hadith, Sahih hadith, that tells us, uh, or at least it's got a, it's got a good, good um, chain. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us this: that every person has been given one angel and one devil, devil that is that is basically just, you know, given to them, right? So basically, for every devil, there's a devil that is trying to get to my heart, okay? Allah Azza wa Jal has given every single person here, including me, an angel that counterattacks what the shaitan might want to do to my heart. So just as the, the shaitan is trying to penetrate and trying to get me in ghafla, trying to get me in, in a state where I'm, I'm forgetting Allah, the angel is trying to make me remember Allah. Have you ever had these thoughts when you're going towards a bad sort of thing or some, you're about to go and something tells you inside, no, I, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be doing this. I, I, I don't think it's right. I, don't, I, I, I shouldn't be doing this. Have you had those thoughts? Yep. Only a few people said yes. The rest of you, mashallah, angels sitting here, mashallah. I don't know who I'm preaching to, right? If you've had those thoughts, those thoughts come directly from the angel. Where well, equally, if the shaitan wants to put that injection inside you, the, the, the angel tries to remind you that, no, look, Allah is watching, don't do this, it's not right, you know, should be remembering Allah, should be going towards the right path, I shouldn't be doing this. That angel is appointed to, to make you think the right thing. So you don't end up on the day of judgment saying, oh Allah, you know, it, it, it wasn't a fair test. You guys understand? You put me on the earth, you put all these things around me, and then you send the devil, and he comes to my heart, and he's injecting inside there, and I'm getting all drugged up with the whisperings of the shaitan. You could have put some antidote inside there to put me back to normal again. Well, Allah has put the antidote already, okay? He's put an angel that gives you all those good thoughts. So today's session was uh, more on the heart. It was about the penetration into the heart. And what we've got to understand is that good or bad, each and every one of us, in any state of our lives, we could have something, and, and this is uh, before we close today, this is, this is the thing that no one, not a single one of us ever stays in the same condition for our entire life. You gotta understand. So even today, mashallah, alhamdulillah, you come to the masjid, you listen to this, you're in a good practice, you come for Isha to the masjid, you are, you know, you're, you're, you're inclined towards the deen, to the Quran, to the, don't you ever think that that has to be the same state you're in for another 30 years. May Allah, may Allah give us tawfiq, say ameen. But that doesn't have to be the case, right? And we're always shifting. And what's shifting us? All these, all, I mean, shaitan is one thing, but you know, there, there's, there's also our own conditions that are happening outside there. And if we don't watch out, we, we, could, we could shift in, in, in time. And also, there's good news in this, which is, if you think today you're not that close to Allah, then all you've got to do is, you've got to find a way to de-clog the heart and you know, get, the, get the wrong penetration out, right? And get the right penetration into the heart, and you'd be, you'd be there, you'd be fine. Now, what we're going to do in the, in the next few sessions is, we're going to visit these one by one, right? We're going to visit the different, you know, good states of the heart as well as the bad states of the heart, and I'm going to give further things of, for example, how 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 do you how do you get yourself, you know, a person who's like in any one of these cases. Let's say you've got jealousy, you've got arrogance. Let's say you've got one of the diseases of the heart. How do you get yourself to to come out of that and to be on the good side? And 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 what the and, and what's going to happen in the next few sessions is, for example, someone who's arrogant. The opposite of that is humbleness. How do you move yourself from an arrogant state to a humble state? What are the things that you need to go through? What's the process to make yourself move out of that? Someone who's greedy, the opposite of that is to be generous. How do you move greed from your heart and become generous? How do you do that? So all these opposites, we're going to visit them one by one, inshallah, in the next few sessions. Uh, f um, have you got any questions before we, we end? I've got an announcement to make as well. Anyone who's got any questions? On today or even yes uh, last last week's session 
Any questions? No? Okay. Zakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الحاملات سنا ونور والرسمات هنا سرور يا حلوات الكاسنين. The Safar curriculum covers all the Islamic educational needs of young Muslims today in a fun, simple, and engaging way. Tried and tested for over 15 years at one of the UK's leading maktabs. The curriculum has been adopted by hundreds of institutions around the world and makes your child's journey in seeking knowledge easy, meaningful, and dynamic. This innovative and comprehensive curriculum covers Quran and Tajweed, Islamic studies, du'as and surahs, as well as Arabic in an integrated and structured way. Visit safarpublications.org to find out more.